Aaron, our city council rep. Welcome. Does anyone want to make a motion to approve the minutes? I move that we approve these minutes. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes. Look, uh, getting the rest of them that the September meet first meeting was just uh, Cameron and I discussed it. You know, it was just the two of us, so there was no quorum and we adjourned. Um, so I can get that one of those there off my desk pretty <laughs> silly, but uh, the rest thank of the you so much. <laughs> my goodness, no, thank you guys. Um, so we left our last meeting, like, yeah, a lot of to do's um, or a lot of, you know, uh, meetings in the interim. Does anyone want to start with any report backs? Um, yeah, I, I think I actually sent them out. I thought I had missed a meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I was away. Uh, I've been away a lot for the last few. So anyway, uh, I think you may have. Did I, did I send it to everybody or just to you? Yeah, I think that was the rule, right? You have to share with everybody. Okay, so there's nothing nothing new there. Um, um, if you've read them, you know what I have to say. Um, if not, I can report it. Does anyone need me to go through these again? I think that would be helpful. All right. Yeah. So I, I had a telephone conversation with Kate Nicolay at uh, CV, uh, Central Vermont Adult Basic Education, CVABE, um, about their uh, LEP program. They're still doing English as, ling as, a, English as a, um, second language, um, only now uh, at, at the Montpelier Center. Uh, but they do some classes live, a few classes live, and they do some work on Zoom as well. Um, the, they have an English language teacher in Montpelier. The program is available to anyone uh, age 16 or over. Um, if they're not enrolled in any pub, in a pub, in a school, so the focus is really on adults. Um, they do some class small groups, but they do also a lot of uh, one one on one, um, and they may be doing more larger groups when if the COVID emergency passes. Um, they, in addition to uh, the teacher, they use hot tutors, and this is CVABE's way of working. They use tutors from the community a lot. Um, and then the, those tutors are not necessarily trained in, in, uh, as tutors, but they get, they get some in service, um, but they're mostly there to supplement what the instructor is doing, not to substitute for it. Mm -hmm. um, currently, there are, about 50, there are about 15 people enrolled. Um, and again, that's low because of the COVID uh, and the, uh, pandemic. Um, <coughs> and, and, excuse me? Sorry, that's me coughing, Michael. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm just looking here in my notes. <laughs> um, so, uh, and uh, the other reason that they're having problems with attendance is because a lot of people doing were were doing and are I guess still are doing homeschooling. They have some connection with St. Michael's College um, in Colchester uh, because St. Mike's has a program, a, a degree program, uh, in uh, teaching English as a second language, or I've forgotten what it's called now, but um, anyway, they do have, they do make, have connections there and they get students to come and serve as teachers in their own program and they get some students doing volunteer work. So as I said, there's, um, it's, it's a, it based it on adults, there's no fee for any students. And they're looking forward to sort of picking up where they've been leave, where they had to leave off. Um, and if Kate was saying she'd be happy to have more conversation with anyone who wants to, you know, to connect with them about from our group. Um, there didn't seem to be anything more that they needed from us at any rate, except maybe to help with advertising. Uh, so that's that's my report on that part. 
Any questions on that or next steps that we should take? The only thing I can think of is, you know, is there, as we explore making city services and information more accessible to non-English speakers, LEP folks, um, would they be a resource for how to do that with this community of folks, um, whether it's translation services that we might need or best practices for, you know, producing material in different languages. So I don't think if there's anything too specific, but it sounds like they might be able to be a resource to point us in the right direction if we need it. I guess so. I mean, uh, in in one respect, they're understaffed. There's one one teacher, uh, and uh, I, I don't know how much we would want to lean on any one person to, to do this, but obviously they um, they they know how to communicate with people who have limited English capability. I mean, that was not. There was no no suggestion from Kate. You know, you know, come to us if you have any questions, but uh, if you, if you need some help, but she certainly in, invited you know further further discussion, so we could do that. So, what's the most common foreign language? She didn't People tell are... me that. Okay. And I didn't ask, so. She... Yeah, maybe we can start that. You know, what is the first one, second one? Because Jeremy um, suggested translation, which is, I think, a good idea. So if you know which other languages are being spoken in Montpelier in addition to uh, English, maybe we can find volunteers who know like good English and help us to translate. OK, well, I can get back definitely, to her. Oh, sorry, that. Michael. Yeah, I can get back to her about that. I definitely had reached out to the schools as well to try to figure that out. And um, uh, it's interesting because there isn't any one like overarching other language, like second language. There's a lot of like smaller groups. And so that gets a little tricky when it comes to um, translation services. Not say we can't do it. I, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it's not like you know, in North Carolina, the second language is very clearly Spanish. Everyone speaks Spanish. Most everyone speaks Spanish. And so um, here it's a little different. And I think that it's going to take work. And I think that getting them to be a resource would be really helpful to me to, you know, as staff to try to like, at least make posters of like, if this is the language you speak, tell us so that we can get you a translator, mm -hmm. right? Because that that's step one, like those are the kind of things and signs that we need, because we do have a call like a translating service that we pay for, but it doesn't help me if I don't know what language they speak, right? So um, that would be really helpful if we could get like signs made with the most common other languages in this area that say like, if this is the language you speak, we can call for you, you just need to tell us. So um, that would be really helpful. Yeah, and that's, I think that's, that's a great comment. Um, I know in Burlington, so the medical center has a pretty robust translation um, service. And there's like a list of 18 commonly spoken languages in the Burlington area. And it's, they're not producing materials and translation in all those languages, but they're in those languages, like you said, Cameron, offering like a brief, like, statement to get folks to a translation service that can help them. So, yeah. All right, thanks all. Um, should I give my report back on talking with Essex about group stipend, um, board commissions, committees, stipends? Okay. Um, so um, the city of Essex also worked with Keisha and Tabitha and Creative Discourses, and they're kind of continuing that process um, to uh, with for for you know creating you know working on um, equity um, in the town. 
Um, they also said that Vermont League of Cities and Towns is working on an equity toolkit for towns and that, um, oh, they, and they're like, Cameron's probably involved in that. So, okay, never mind. So I guess it's a subcommittee of the, of their board. And so um, that, or that, like that Bill would, Bill would know, or, you know, you know but that, that's, that's in the works of staying okay. tuned. So um, they came up with this um, plan, uh, you know, not that long ago. And so it hasn't been implemented yet. Um, they're going to be implementing it in January, but it's instituted for the FY22 budget. And so starting in January of 2022. And so what they did is they asked all of the boards, committees, and commissions um, to let them know how, met, how many people there were, how many seats there were, and then how often they met. And excluded from this were the select board, board of trustees, village zoning board, village planning commission, because they already see, receive stipends. And then they calculated that out by $50 a meeting for each person for all of those meetings. And knowing that they then cancel those meetings, people aren't going to fill out the form, people are going to opt out, not all of the seats are going to be filled. They've over budgeted pretty significantly, um, rec you know, recognizing that all of those things were going to happen. So overall, the total figure was $32,250. And they kind of took that in the same budget line item as like the select board stipends budget. So it was just kind of all in that same same line item. Um, and so it's a basically a one page form that people need to fill out. That's basically their address, their contact information saying that they opt in for the, the stipends or that they opt out, opt out of the stipends. And like, that's it. There is a certain threshold. One of the complicating factors here though is that there's a certain threshold for reporting to IRS. And so some folks who are on multiple boards that meet really frequently, they might go above that threshold. And in that case, so it's just, it, it, it is more administration that they had originally anticipated um, for some of these, you know, key, key people. And so, um, you know, they, by, by you know, filling out this form, people become um, like staff of the town. Um, and then once they kind of go above that level, then they need to fill out their like 1099s and um, kind of all of those official more, more tax forms. But most people aren't going to be rising above that threshold. Um, so uh, I believe those are the main things. And it's going to be paid in lump sum in the first and third quarter, kind of same thing as how the select board members and board of trustees get paid. Um, and it's like recognizing that, you know, Maybe that means that people are gonna be, you know, get an honorarium for a meeting that gets canceled and they're just kind of working that into the budget. Any questions about that? It really seems like something that could, you know, 32,000, I was like, that, that's a significant amount of money, but also it's not gonna be that amount that much, or it's not gonna be the amount that it's budgeted. It's gonna be less than that. Um, and it definitely seemed like something that I felt that we could do. Shana, are they going to advertise this stipend? They're doing it. it mostly through the committee chairs. Okay. They're kind of putting it on the committee chairs to make sure that everyone fills out the form. Well, I mean, um, so as a way oh, to recruit new people, the they met, and there's the stipend. Yeah. I didn't talk to them about that. And that seems really important. Yeah. <laughs> so, and again, you know, it hasn't been instituted yet. It's going yeah, into yeah. effect in January. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that should be an important part of it. Can I ask a question too? I'm assuming that it's for appointed boards as opposed as opposed to other volunteers. So in, in our situation, you know, we have our advisory board, um, which I'm thinking that might apply to, but not our volunteers, not the other 45 volunteers that we use for our programs. So yeah, it's for boards, committees, and commissions. And um, I don't think they have a list of what that includes. They just have a list of what that doesn't include of the groups that already have the stipends. Yeah. So that would be a good, yeah. You know, and the purpose is to compensate people for their time as well as offer assistance for childcare, food, transportation, and other needs in order for volunteers to be able to attend meetings. So, cool. Anything else or can I dive into housing real quick? before handing it over to Marty and as I'll head out, but I'll read the notes very carefully. <laughs> um, so I just talked to Kirby in planning um, about their um, work with, uh, with, I think with housing task force or, and, and wanting, you know, engaging housing task force around 
the zoning process. And I think there's kind of two main takeaways from that conversation is one, they've had this long, um, long standing goal or, you know, in their vision statement of having adequate supply of housing for current and future residents that is safe, affordable, resilient, et cetera. Um, and then they want to add a second one this year for the first time that's a little bit more focused on equity. So if housing for all and, a, you know, affirmatively um, and diversify housing, kind of have the, a goal in here more for like transitional housing could fit in here, um, the end of, of, you know, working, um, working more for, you know, putting in this second goal of, you um, yeah, no, of, of kind of more affirmatively saying that housing is a right for for everyone. Um, there is, you know, obviously a lot more in uh, housing in the planning team that pe they would like love our, you know, perspective and input on that they're working with um, the housing task force on, you know, of parking requirements for rental units, ABN Airbnbs and short-term rentals, um, local developers, um, rezone, redistricting, rezoning, um, or redid zoning, sorry, and um, uh, boop, 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 and you know just other changes of, of zoning um, in, in other parts of the city as well. Um, but those are kind of where the the main thing is over the next few months they're going to be more looking at these goals and would love our input on that. So wanted to invite um, us to those meetings when they when they do happen. Cool. Are they gonna Are they gonna share that? In, like, are they gonna proactively reach out or do I need to make a mental note to track those? Um, I think Kirby, it sounded like Kirby wanted, was going to reach out, but maybe uh, if you are, if you're the point person for those, if you could keep trying to make a mental note. Like, okay, no. Okay, let's no, not but, to but, reach out. You know, okay. obviously I can talk to folks, so. Yeah. We'll, we'll count on Kirby to, to reach back out. Cool. All right, Marty, how is it? Um, yes, well, I think what I was asked to talk about were the, the I don't know what you'd say, the things that are on the table, sort of, um, the, and, 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 to, and to tell you that none of these are actually in the pipeline, in process. There's a lot of, I'm amazed at how much there is of um, pre-planning and consulting and revising and all of that. Um, so, but I'll tell you the, the ones that we have, the one is, this one I don't know about, three units on Ewing Street, which is over, um, runs off of North Street. Um, and I assume that's in addition to somebody's current, um, current dwelling. Uh, so I, I'll say that we also have um, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, and where someone can add on to a house, divide a house up into apartments, build a little cottage in the yard, um, just any, any ways to put more housing in their space. And the zoning laws were changed about that, I think a couple of years ago, so it's more possible, but there hasn't been very much interest so far. I think there's an effort to make people aware of that. Think, thinking for instance, that older people who don't wanna manage a whole big house now might be interested in building a, uh, you know, dividing their house, building a duplex, building an apartment. And also, and I guess that they found that some people just don't want the hassle of renting, you know, all that goes with renting. So, so it hasn't really taken off very much. Um, then the next one is a, a multifamily unit on Northfield Street on the former Brown Derby um, property. And that's, that's been in process for a long time, but there's still no, um, there are no contracts out yet. Uh, but that, and I, I didn't find out the number, I think it's something like 40, um, 40 dwellings would be built on that property. Um, the, the last phase of Stonewall Meadows condo, and I, I don't know about that. Stonewall Meadows is up, I think, off of uh, Hebert Road. Um, Habit, Habitat for Humanity Northfield Street Project. Christ Church Project, and I can say a little bit more about that in a minute because I, I know more about it. Vermont College of Fine Arts. They are not proposing to do anything, but they're open to have, they have a lot of unused space up there, a lot of uh, buildings that aren't, aren't being used. And they would be open to somebody 
developing a project there and, and perhaps working in partnership, but not not being the, the uh, planner of that. And uh, Elm Street next to Community College of Vermont, up on the rise up above there, there's a there's uh, planning about or thinking about um, units built on that on that rise just above the college. And Washington County Mental Health is um, is interested in their Heaton Street building, which is not fully used anymore. They're interested in developing some of that or all of that into uh, into housing. And uh, about the Christ Church project, they, they, they were sort of well on their way before the pandemic, and then and the um, difficulties with the the uh, parking lot there, the the um, Bashara's, Mr. Bashara's parking lot. And what holds them back now is that they have to have, have some kind of agreement about parking because you can't have a, a apartment building there with no parking. There's lots of parking there, but, but the church doesn't own it. Um, and their plan was to build a four-story building, one story for their own use and the other three for, uh, for affordable housing. And I know that, I know they're discussing it, but the, I just, I've I've been surprised at how much pre-discussion has to happen and how much planning and how much research and oops, we're almost there, but we had to stop and change to something else. So I'm, that's really all, I'm glad to answer questions if I can, but that's really all the information I have. Except, except, of course, to say that we're really aware of how much pretty desperate need there is for housing in this town and how hard it is to find anything. I have friends who've been looking for rentals, just looking and looking and can't find anything. Um, and buy, buying is probably even worse. Um, it's really hard to buy a house in Montpelier right now. And many, many sales are to people from other places. And, who were willing to um, buy things sight unseen and buy things at well above the asking price. You know, it kind of mm -hmm. prices people here out of the market. Mm -hmm. Michael, you had a question? Yes, well, a couple of things. Ewing Street is over here uh, near College Street, um, uh. Uh, right, off, right off of Main Street. Um, but there, a few years ago, when the bottle redemption uh, building was torn down. You remember that? Yeah. It was a yeah. plan to yeah. replace it with a three-story building, as I recall. One was going to be a replacement for the bottle redemption, and then two floors above, I assume, were going to be either office space or housing. Does anyone know of it? What, what happened to that plan? I mean, I know that the, the bottle redemption folks pulled out of it, but the, the, I was on the planning, no, on the de development review board at the time. Mm -hmm. And the preliminary plan for that was approved. Um, I haven't heard anything about it since. It's now a grassed over, you know, paved over and grassy lot. Yeah. Is anything planned for that space, you know? I don't know. I haven't heard it discussed lately. No, you haven't heard anything either? No. Okay. I, I've seen it. I, I think it's on <clears throat> upcoming council agendas. Is like we were presented. I don't know, maybe two years ago with a, a an analysis of different ways to use that lot. And that consultant, it, it was definitely seemed to be like the preferred one would be to develop it with like mixed use, like housing on the upper floors and um, commercial. And then, but then, yeah, like that particular thing kind of fell apart. And then, you know, other people, of course, want it to be like tied into Confluence Park or, so, you know, something. So there were... Mm -hmm. So my sense was like doing some of the park, having it as an open space for now doesn't preclude development later. Um, and so it's like just an ongoing possibility, but nothing is like really in the works as far as I know, but I, I could not, I could not be in the loop <laughs> about something, but, um, but that was the last I'd heard about it. Um, Marty, thanks for joining us and sharing 
uh, about those projects. I think if I could kind of speak for the committee, this, this came from, so we did this big kind of survey of the community around equity issues. I don't know if you saw any of the presentations or materials. Um, and, you know, housing and equity definitely came up as a concern from the community and something that we've, I know council has been thinking about, a lot of us have been thinking about. Um, and I think in inviting you, um, we're looking for thoughts about how this committee focused on, you know, social and economic justice could play some kind of a role within this, you know, larger set of issues around housing inequity and accessibility in, in the community. So I'm, I'm wondering if there are any like real needs other than we need people with capital who can come and develop more units, housing units. Are there any needs you're seeing in your role where we could be some help um, in advancing the issue and getting people together who need to get together? So I wonder what thoughts you have about that. Oh, gee. Um. It's not something I, that I've been directly thinking about, I, but so much of this depends on funding from different pools and streams and, and people applying for their own grants in some cases for things. So maybe better publicity to people, a diverse group of people who, are, who might be interested in either an apartment or a house. Um, and I read, I read your, state, your statement online that you sent around. And I think, um, you know, I think not, not everybody is aware of what's available and, uh, and aware that they might be included, uh, that they might be kept in mind when, um, when things are being planned. So I think getting better information to people, to a variety of people, um, who could then participate in what's, and, and, be, and then be better publicizing various mm -hmm. grants and services, their incentive grants sometimes so that someone could, could start to work on something, but just making sure that they go to um, a diverse group of people so that people know it's for me too. Mm -hmm. um, um, do you think this funding, it, it's, I don't know who, what type of funding this is, but it does it cover, folks who are seeking housing, as well as people who maybe want to develop housing, become landlords in some way? Is that the range of things we're talking about? Um, I think so. I, one, one, one resource to really tap is Downstreet yeah. Housing, uh, which is based in Barrie, but they have, they have um, control of or operate a lot of different grants and programs and could really sit down with people and, and give them information about how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a program to help people with um, who are looking to build accessory dwelling units, a, a, um, a uh, incentive program. So, so there's sometimes that people can get loans that have to be paid back or, or, or grants that don't have to be paid back. Both, mm -hmm. both things can happen. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and we might we might be better in touch with them down street about um, because they own lots of properties, but they also do a lot of education and you know for new home buyers or new home builders. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, I'm wondering if for our group, does it make sense to invite somebody from down street if we want to learn more about some of the things Marty is mentioning? Yes. I can do that for y'all. You have a pretty strong contact you could reach out to, Cameron. Mm -hmm. I think that, that sounds like a, a good next step. Anyone else have any? Other questions for Marty or comments on on any of this? Not really, um, Marty. When you talk about um, advertising, like opportunities for a more diverse group, 
are y'all doing like is the housing task force doing any of that work or or thought about how to do that kind of stuff or has that not come up it really hasn't come up um okay and i i would be really happy to bring it up when we yeah. meet again um okay. it's a really good idea thank you Yeah, I mean, that connects to one of our other topics from last time is making information more widely available to <laughs> make sure opportunities like this are, are more well known. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's something we'll be keeping on our radar too, Marty. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, think about doing a, an article in the bridge, something mm -hmm. lots of people read. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They're pretty open to to submissions from the community, I think. Yeah. I just want to say too that I know Capstone is an organization that does a lot with like housing vouchers for people. So that's um, you know, when I'm thinking about getting information to people, of course, I'm thinking about the population we work with and some of the folks that need um, housing um, that you know might have a criminal history or other mm -hmm. issues around getting housing. Um, so I know Capstone is a good resource too for people. So it seems like they might, you might want to rope them into um, figuring out how to share information and, and get information from them. Because I, from what I understand, those, those voucher programs, they change all the time and they're really compli complicated. You know? mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I have no idea how they get used. I've tried to learn a little bit and I just kind of threw my hands up because it's, it's so complex. Mm -hmm. And it's Alfred's job really. So I think I can leave it to him. Um, Carol, for my information, cause I'm feeling a little in the dark. Can you tell me a bit what Capstone organization is? Yeah, they're a social service agency that assists people with um, all kinds of things. You can you can look it up online. They're okay. located right here in Washington County, and um, they help people with um, budgeting, you know, family services, um, housing. Those are, I think, they're the main things that they help people with. Mm -hmm. They'll provide education to people about how to do budgeting and, and um, you know, help them with family services, basically. I can add some stuff to that. Um, they're a regional organization. They're left over from the, the um, Great Society, um, the community councils, and uh, Capstone just changed its name a few years ago. It used to be Central Vermont Community Action Council. Um, and the, the, this one is Central Vermont. So it's Washington County, Lamoille County, um, uh, yeah. some parts of Orange County, some little bits of other places. but. So they're, 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 they're pretty much, you know, working in a, a wide region, but their they're, they're headquarters are in Barry. Um, and they also do things like insulation and the food shelf and some training programs and things like okay. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, curious. So that's a great recommendation, Carol. For us, what do you all think? Is it a situation in which we maybe individually, one of us reaches out to someone there or do we invite someone from Capstone? Maybe at the same meeting that we could have a downstreet person come in. Um, I'm not sure what the best approach might be. I can also help with that. Okay. Does it, does it make sense to have a, a capstone person and a downstreet housing person kind of come at the same time? Yeah. I think that they have very similar information. And also I think it would mean a lot for y'all to sort of convene them together mm -hmm. so that they can have a conversation together yeah. and maybe create inroads with them working as a partnership together. They they obviously talk, that does yeah. exist. So. Yeah. I'll try to see also if there's some overlap that they have that we can plug into. Great. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Cameron. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I think um, if we don't have any other questions for Marty, um, Marty, you're welcome to, to stay on as we kind of wrap up, but 
you're also feel free to jump off if you've got other things you need to get to. Thanks for coming. Well, if you if you have more questions along this line, you could get in touch with me or with Polly Nickel, who's the the chair of the committee. Mm -hmm. and appreciate being asked. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Martin. Um, okay. So let me pop back into the agenda here. Um, this one, okay. Our next agenda was budget items for proactive priority work. Which, Cameron, Michael, would, do you have? Yeah, do you know what that's yeah. about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Michael um, has been helping me work through the history section on the city's website, right? And right. he's found a local historian that could help us hmm. sort of flesh that out in a more uh, equitable way. Hmm. And uh, he deserves payment for that. And so we needed a vote from y'all to uh, use some of your funds okay. to pay him. And Michael, it's not very much, right? It's like what? Two, two, about 200. Uh... Well, 200 for the one stipend, and I suggested putting in $100 in case we need to um, get permission to pay fees for new images. Hmm. Actually, there are two people working on it. The state archaeologist has um, promised to do a couple of paragraphs on the prehistoric pre period, uh, or meaning before the white folks settled, settled here. Hmm. Um, and uh, that way he's not charging any fee. He said that's part of his job. So that uh, he, he, he's not asking for any, any fee. And the other is Paul Carnahan, who was a co-author of a book um, uh, about Montpelier, came out under the History Press a few years ago, mostly photographs, but with some introductory sections. And he's written a draft that he's given to me to, with, with permission to edit and, um, and make suggestions. So okay. that book is is underway, okay. and he asked for a two hundred dollars stipend. Okay, and then the addition, as I said, the additional hundred dollars is in case the historical society asks for a fee. I think they probably would not, but um, can't be sure. They do typically um, uh, ask for small fees for using using their collections. Mm -hmm. So the but total budget for uh, we're at. And I don't know what budget would you would need from the city side for put it, getting all this put together. No, nothing. It would just be time that my time because mm -hmm. I can I can edit the website. So um, nothing. So it would just be a vote to um, approve spending three hundred dollars out of y'all's budget line for this okay. work. Okay. So we'll... Does anyone like to make a motion? I'll make the motion to to approve a, a budget of three hundred dollars for the the Montpelier web page, the Montpelier history page of the city's website. Mm -hmm. I second. Okay. Um, all right. All those in favor of passing this motion for three hundred dollars for the history section of the website, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Always feels good to spend money. <laughs> um, great. Thanks, Michael, for doing all that work to get it organized and use your contacts. Appreciate that. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, when, when could we um, start to review materials? Or do you want us to review materials? You just want to handle it yourself. Would you let us know? Um, I have a draft from Paul now that I put aside because I've had other things going on and, and he was in, in no rush to uh, get it back. So um, I think by the, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that by the middle of October, I can really sit down with, I read it through, I read through it once um, and made some suggestions, but I need some more time to work on it and I'll work on it with him directly. And then, once we get a, a um, and I haven't gotten back, I haven't heard anything back from the state archaeologist. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll remind him now that we've got, we're going forward with this, that he's made that commitment. So mm -hmm. I would say late October, I don't think there's any rush for this, but mm -hmm. I would like to get it moving and yeah. I will hope to bring it back to the, uh, bring it to the committee 
in late October. I think it's a good idea for since we're we're spearheading the change uh, for the committee to read what what's being offered. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks for for that. Later next month. Okay, um, let's move on. Anyone else have any other business for this morning? Carol, did you want to talk about um, the cab at all, or? Um, I can, I was going to reach out individually to folks, but I'm oh, um, sorry. So Ruined that's it. okay. That's all right. Um, so with the transition of um, Yvonne Bird retiring from um, the Justice Center, um, and I think because of due to COVID, we, you know, a few people have, um, have retired from our advisory board. And we're looking for new members. And so I thought about um, this committee as potential people who might be interested in learning more about what we do at the Justice Center and to see if that's a fit to serve on our advisory board. Um, it's, a, it's a once a quarter com commitment. We have a two hour meeting once a quarter. Um, and it, it's basically the way I envision the role is serving as an ambassador in the community for restorative justice, what we do at the Justice Center, helping people understand you know, what it is um, that we do. And also advising in that, um, you know, helping us shape our strategic plan and forming our goals, um, maybe contributing to what our community forums should look like. We're required to do two community forums every year. And it's really, I mean, that, that's what they tell us so we can shape them in any way that we want. And for me, it's really tied to the social issues, you know, so, so I, I think what we're doing, moving, moving things forward with restorative practices um, is successful only if we're making other changes, cultural changes, um, and really supporting the folks that we work with in, in other ways. So, so it seems like a really good fit. And, um, and so anyone who's interested in talking to me more about that, or, or I might reach out to you and, and uh, see if you're, if you're interested in sitting on our, our advisory board. Mm -hmm. How large of a group is it? Um, right now, I think we have six people. Um, and we, you know, we're, we're looking for um, both skills and diversity. So we have um, we try to keep two folks who are under the age of 22 and, um, and a variety of range of interests um, and backgrounds um, on the advisory board. So we have somebody who works in the schools. We have somebody who, as part of his job, is, on, um, is a probation officer. Cameron sits on the advisory board. We will, now that Dan, Dan Richardson stepped up to, to serve on the cab, um, and now that he's gone, <laughs> we're looking for another, um, another city council member serves on the advisory board. Um, we have somebody who helped, um, helped form the, the Community Justice Center. She, so she's been on for the last 18 years. Um, she's been on for a really long time. So yeah, we're looking for some diverse voices and people who live in the community who are interested in in what we do. And Brian Pete also sits on the on the advisory board, mm -hmm. you know, in his capacity. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, any other business this morning, folks? Okay, not seeing anything. Um, all right, so next time we meet, do we have a sketch of an agenda? I know we've got some kind of standing things here. Um, I guess some of it depends, Cameron, on when um, the two guests that we'd like to have can come. Um, so I guess you'll figure that out and let us know. So your next meeting is scheduled for October 6th. October 6th, thanks. Yes. And um, some other stuff that we still have on your upcoming like conversations include some of those public forums. So that might be an interesting um, sort of feedback loop with the CJC. Um, Carol, this group had talked about doing some forums on housing, uh, racism, like bathroom access, or just, I, I was assuming that one had to do with folks experiencing homelessness. Um, 
but I think Jeremy, what I would pitch for y'all is, is the council's strategic planning process. Um, right. They should have a, a draft by then. So okay. um, I would add that, I would say, you know, members of Downstreet and Capstone and then start working on any feedback that you may have to the strategic plan. Great, that makes sense to me. Um, I imagine we could, we could fill a lot of our time looking at that strategic plan. Um, mm -hmm. So let's set those things as our agenda items for next time. Um, <coughs> I think that is gonna, gonna take us out unless you see anything else? No, no, okay. Um, okay, well that'll do it for this morning. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yeah, good to see Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Carol, bye.